showing of the remarkable lost world of Mitchell and Kenyon. This is Morecambe Seafront in the summer of 1901. It was filmed by two pioneering filmmakers from Lancashire. Eight hundred of these remarkable short films were recently discovered in the basement of a shop in Blackburn. But they were nearly lost forever. The films of Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon take us to the world of ordinary people a hundred years ago. They capture them going about their daily lives, leaving work, watching football, catching a tram in the rush hour. These films by Mitchell and Kenyon, who are based here at Blackburn, offer a unique glimpse into a remote Edwardian world. We'll look at life in the city, life at work, in an age before the cinema existed. But what interests me in particular are the people who appear in these films. What can these films tell us about their lives? beginning of the 20th century, these early film moguls ran their business from the back of a shop, marketing themselves with the slogans, local films and we take them and make them, Mitchell and Kenyon bought into a brand new technology, moving pictures. In this series, we're going to look at the unlikely story of these Lancashire businessmen and explore their films to find out what they can tell us about life a hundred years ago. The films that Mitchell and Kenyon shot were of local people and local events. They weren't meant to be documentary records of the time, but were made purely for commercial reasons. Seeing yourself on screen was an amazing and almost magical event in those days, and people paid just to see themselves. What's fascinating for a modern audience is how much the films reveal about the people in them. And of course, as always, you know, the more you look, the more you see, the more you begin to get the language of the age, you can decipher and understand and read the people in an almost eerie manner, actually. People loved being filmed. For many, it would be their only chance to be recorded for posterity. Though not everyone was so keen. Today we're used to being observed and documented. Security cameras, bank transactions, driving licenses dental record. But in 1900, things were very different for ordinary working people. They um, had birth certificates, death certificates, marriage licenses would be recorded, but otherwise, not much. These people could lead their whole lives and leave very little trace behind. <laughs> But we have managed to track down the descendants of some of the people in these films. To see my great-grandfather um, playing rugby um, in 1901 is just absolutely amazing. To see him running around 
um, a man who was born 90 to 100 years before I was born, a man who died before I was born, to actually see him physically doing things is just incredible. This is the Batley rugby team from Yorkshire. Mick Judge's great-grandfather, Paddy Judge, was a second row forward. Theo, your great-great-granddad's on here. He is. There he is, just going through now, just before the fellow with the silly scrum cap. It's just bizarre that this match, 103 years ago near enough, and watching it like you're watching it today almost. I just can't believe that. <laughs> I really can't get over the fact that they're wearing belts with the shorts. And it's just incredible. And that the referee looks like he's dressed up for some sort of country walk rather than anything else. Looks like he's got you know, probably plus fours or wellies or something. Here I am watching the film with my year old son on my knee and here's the family stretching all the way back. You don't imagine that a member of your family who's not famous, who's not a politician or royalty or a hero or anything like that, it's, it's almost unbelievable to see them moving around, to see them in the flesh in that sort of situation. Between 1897 and 1913, the partnership of Mitchell and Kenyon made hundreds of these films. When the business finally folded in the 1920s, the original negatives were packed away in the basement of the shop. In 1994, after the shop had changed hands many times, builders were gutting the premises. Beneath years of accumulated rubbish were three large metal containers, which were about to be dumped on the skip. One man, local optician and film enthusiast Peter Worden, was fascinated by Mitchell and Kenyon's work. He was convinced that the films were lost somewhere in the shop. Fortunately, the builders looked inside the containers. They then contacted Peter Worden to see if he thought the films were worth keeping. It occurred to me that this could very reasonably be the Mitchell and Kenyon films. And indeed, it, it was. And then the task began of organising it and sorting it. So the problem then was what to do with the material because how does one store over 850 rolls, as it turned out, of nitrate film, which of itself is highly inflammable. So then I thought, well, the most logical place to put these would be in as well-controlled a temper environment as I could reasonably lay my hands on. and arrangements were made to transfer the material to the British Film Institute, who obviously had far greater capabilities than I could ever even begin to aspire to. The British Film Institute stored the films in their vaults at the National Film and Television Archives Conservation Centre in Berkhamsted. The painstaking process of preserving and restoring the 800 negatives for the nation began. The films were shot on nitrate stock, which is notoriously flammable. The fact they were stored in a cool place for 80 years probably saved them from deteriorating completely and had to be stored in a safe place before they could be restored. The storage cells are made out of reinforced concrete and have steel doors, all very bunker-like. Now, let's go into one of the cells. This is where things get particularly interesting. Up here is a, a glass ceiling, and above my head are 6,000 gallons of water. The idea is that if a fire breaks out in here, the water will keep the room relatively cool. But if things get very bad and all these nitrate films ignite, then 
The ceiling is designed to be the weakest part of the cell. It will break and the flames will rush up and out rather than going to the cells on each side. The films were buckled and brittle, but crucially, they were the original negatives. The archivists knew that if they could restore them, the results would be amazing. Many of the films had to be printed frame by frame. At 960 frames a minute, the whole collection makes up over a million and a half frames. The restoration project took just under three years. It is now one of the largest collections of early non-fiction films in the world. Moving pictures were one of the technological breakthroughs of the late 19th century. The first moving picture machine was invented in America in 1892. The first film was shown to an audience in Paris in 1895. Cameras at this time were hand cranked. What we're used to watching from this period are films that are often at the wrong speed. The transfer process enables us to watch the films at virtually the speed they were meant to be shown. James Kenyon, seen here directing mill workers for the camera, went into partnership with Sagar Mitchell just two years after the first ever screening of a moving picture. Kenyon had originally made Penny in the slot machines and Mitchell was a photographer. When they set up business in Blackburn, they were right at the beginning of a brand new technology, the internet boom of its time. This was 10 years before Charlie Chaplin made his first movie. Even basic techniques like editing hadn't been developed yet. Like most films of the time, Mitchell and Kenyon's were usually one continuous shot with no close-ups, hardly any camera movement. They were also silent. Many of Mitchell and Kenyon's films were shot as people left work. They were able to pack their shots with as many people as they could squeeze into the frame. They were all potential customers. It was a real novelty to see moving pictures of yourself. They were advertised with posters. And leaflets were handed out giving the dates and times of the shows, proclaiming, see yourself as others see you. These films would then be projected in fairground tents or local meeting halls because there were no cinemas yet. Now these films often have scratched on the first frame a bit of information about them. Now let's read this one. Ah, oh, yes, Haslam's. Limited Colm, when it was made January the 29th, 1900. So one assumes this is the name of the place being recorded. And let's have a go at another one. This one says, oh, Platt's New Works, Oldham, August the 20th, 1900. So that's all the information we actually have about the films, and that's the information I have got to use to find out more about the people who appear in these films. We sent images from some of the films to local Lancashire papers in the hope that someone would recognise one of the mills or factories. Ron Vickers got in touch with us about his grandfather, William Waterhouse, who worked at Glebe Mills when this film was shot. That time, my grandfather would be a young man of about uh, 21 or 2 at this time, I would think. 
Well, this looks like it would be lunch hour because some of them are taking baskets in to, I presume, their parents with their lunches, which was a feature of uh, mill work in that era because there were no canteens and uh, quite a lot of children used to take dinners in to, to the mill to their parents. My grandfather started as a half-timer in the mills when he was ten, having lost his mother in childbirth at that time and to help with the sort of family income it was quite common for children to start work at 10. They were supposed to get permission but I'm not sure whether many of them did. I think a blind eye was turned to a lot of children working these hours in the mill at that time. The boys here would probably be the half-timers. Some of them will only look um, 10 or 11, 12 at the most. My grandfather had schooling in the afternoon uh, after he'd worked in the mill in the morning but that was scanty and um, he very often fell asleep during the lessons and got a clip round the ear for his trouble of falling asleep. He'd been up since six o'clock in the morning working in the mill. My grandfather left school at 12 to work full time in the mill. So, by today's standards, his education was virtually nil, really. But he overcame that in later life. And uh, was very, very well educated by the time he was in his middle age, shall we say. I think he worked at five or six mills in his career before eventually he was made manager of the Burrow Spinning Company in the late 1930s. And he then was co-opted onto the board of directors, which, considering his early life, was a wonderful achievement. These Lancashire women weavers were amongst the highest paid women in industry, earning almost as much as the men they worked alongside. But the majority of women were only earning about 40% of the unskilled men's wages, which is about £82 a week in today's money. The struggle to be a good wife, combining work, housework and motherhood, was exhausting and debilitating. It aged you. The women in these films who look like they're in their 70s are actually probably close to 50. Women could not afford to take time off during pregnancy, so they worked until the last possible moment, often giving birth at work. The children were looked after by grandmothers and neighbours, and, as you can see here, by older sisters, until they were old enough to go to work themselves. Many of them grew up with illnesses like rickets, as you can see by the way the man on the right-hand edge of the picture is walking. Poor diets and lack of hygiene led to eye disease. We think of mining as an all-male preserve, but women worked at the surface in some parts of Lancashire. These women, known as pit brow lassies, worked at the pit head, grading coal and pushing the loaded wagons between the buildings. Known for their independence and physical strength, they're also famous for their working clothes thought to be highly unusual at the time. These lattes are wearing jackets and skirts over leggings. In other coal seams, they wore breeches or short trousers, thought to be very risque. The pit brow lattes were criticised for their lack of femininity, so much so that legislation was being proposed in Parliament to outlaw their job. There was outcry amongst the lassies. They travelled to London in their trousers to prove that their work gear was perfectly decent and they won their case. Women continued to work the coal fields up until the early 1960s. For all these men and women in crowded cities like Wigan, life was looking up. They earned more than their parents had done and were often living in better conditions. But compared to today, the divide between rich and poor was huge. 
The Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, had a personal fortune of £6 million. That's £374 million in today's money. While this teenager would have been earning six shillings for a 68-hour week. There are few old people in these films. People died young. Women lived till 50 on average, men till only 46. Only 1% of the population was over 65. It's now nearly 20 times that. And working conditions, though improving, were still awful. Though horrendous industrial accidents as well as work-related diseases, these loom minders had a very high percentage of prostate cancer, caused by the oil which splashed onto their overalls. These industrial workers migrated from the country to the urban centres. The towns and cities that Mitchell and Kenyon were filming had mushroomed. But people either lived in the city or the countryside. Much of the suburban sprawl that we're so familiar with hadn't been built yet. This film, shot from the top of a tram in the outskirts of Blackpool, shows you could travel from the open countryside to the city centre within minutes. Mitchell and Kenyon filmed cities all over, from Blackpool to this Belfast tram. They found inventive ways to film metropolitan life. Motor cars were still a great rarity. They were out of reach for most of the population. In 1900, there were lots of traffic jams. It was just the modes of transport that were different. With no traffic lights, it was the policeman who had to keep the pedestrians safe and guide the traffic on this Manchester High Street. It was a time of new technologies. Horse-drawn trams were on the way out, and electrified trams were the latest thing. In this film of Bradford, new tram tracks are being added to the network. The open top deck fare was half that of travelling in the downstairs saloon. And for women, negotiating getting on board in a long skirt needed a particular skill. Travel was being democratised. Getting around the city was easier than ever before. The latest design, a safety bicycle with two wheels the same size, had recently been introduced and learned that drivers were trying to handle two wheels rather than four. For most factory workers, the novelty of new electric trams, exotic shopping opportunities and the glimpse of a motor car were by the by. They were caught up in the day-to-day -day drudgery of hard manual work. Skilled workers' unions had existed for 50 years, but for unskilled men, as at Platt's Engineering Works, there was no one to represent their welfare. One of the foundry men working there was Fred Fallows. We put an article in the Oldham Advertiser and found his grandson, Trevor. My grandfather, Fred Fallows, worked at Platt Brothers, and it was a dreadful place to work in. Well, it's interesting that none of them are smiling. But look at the number of people that used to work there. Incredible. The uh, working conditions that those men used to work in were absolutely appalling. The noise, the heat, uh, it was quite deafening. Um, 
the atmosphere must have been unbearable. My grandfather was exactly like these, probably like one with the dirty face, because his job was a very dirty, filthy job, and it made him very thirsty as well. And it's quite interesting to uh, note um, a man stood at the gates there that looks as if he's selling beer. It, uh, he probably came from Oldham Brewery, less than half a mile away. You can see him pulling the pint. When they came out of the foundry, um, they would be very thirsty, very thirsty indeed. Some of them could probably drink 20 pints comfortably. Not an exaggeration. And I think grandfather was one of those as well. <laughs> because conditions were so bad, there was a lot of injury because they were carrying these iron bars and, and they would drop them and break their toes and they would still have to work with a broken toe or a finger. There was quite a lot of amputations, fingers and so on and so forth. And my grandfather, Fred, thought that uh, he would try and improve those conditions, that he would try and set up a representative body, um, like the early formation of a union, so that he could get a, a voice uh, to try to improve the working conditions and pay uh, for his fellow workers. And uh, he actually created this union and was secretary of the union. But the management frowned upon it as a, an infringement of their rights uh, to employ people and to increase the pay, which some of them deservedly earned. In fact, my grandfather, Fred, only earned seven shillings and elevenpence when he was a working married man a week, which is very minimal, even by those standards. People were reluctant to join the union um, because they felt that it would prejudice um, their chances of work and if they were complaining and grumbling then they were easily replaceable. I don't think they got him anywhere, in fact generally speaking I would say that it hindered his promotion chances if he was a moulder 56 years of his life. For his troubles and efforts he uh, received um, a silver ashtray um, which seemed a very minimal retirement present. Um, I would think today it's probably only worth about £10 scrap value, um, but of course it's of great sentimental value to me, and uh, it's a great reminder of the hard life that he endured all his time. <laughs> This film is of workers leaving Vickers and Maxim, a shipbuild in Barrow. Extraordinary collection of um, the people leaving work in their different work clothes, completely a little cross section of Edwardian working society. But then there's this girl appears, smartly dressed, just looking round blankly, staring at the camera, not looking to left or right. There she is, astonishing, eerie, just staring fixedly at the camera. The girl amongst many men, still there, just looking, just gliding out of frame. Sadly, it was impossible to find anything out about the little girl. But luckily, there is some information about the people who worked at Vickers and Maxim. We got in touch with Barrow Public Library, who very kindly sent us a copy of a photograph of men who retired from Vickers in 1919, entitled Vickers Veterans. Crucially, this photograph is accompanied by a list of the names of the men appearing in it. Absolutely amazing. This allowed us to write all the people in Barrow who still bear the same surnames. These include one, T. McCambridge. Incredibly, we got a letter from a woman about McCambridge's daughter, Mary Moran. It was a sight to see, really. When my father was dead, it was shipbuilding, and he was a riveter. 
and the children in front of the, as if they're waiting for the fathers coming out of work. Although some of them would be working, because you can tell by their dirty faces and that, and they, yet they only look about 12 or 13. They swarmed out of the gates uh, at dinner time and tea time. It, it was just like as if the, all the people in Barrow were all across the road and on the pavement. There was only one way out, and everybody had to come down that road, so you couldn't have got a pin in between them when they were all coming out of the gate. It was taking your life in your hands if you were going the opposite way. Well, we've had a lot of royalty come to Barrow because they used to come and launch the ships. People coming from uh, places where they didn't build ships thought it was marvellous to see a ship being launched here. The shipyards have been a constant in Barrow for over a hundred years and they still exist to this day. When I was a child, I used to get permission to go into Vickers to the, the launching pad and see the launch. And it was, it was, it was really exciting then. But you, you just got used to it and it, you just didn't bother. It was just part of your life. They used to shut down for the annual holiday and they didn't get paid for the holidays, you see. So they had to save up all the year round. But um, we didn't need to go away for a holiday because we had plenty of uh, things to do on our front doorstep. We were better off here than even going away to some place. The fairs used to come to the park and uh, there was always tents, and, as they called them. My parents probably saw uh, the film in the fair because uh, that was the only pleasure, really, that they had. With not having the money to go anywhere, that they would be waiting for that coming sort of thing. It would be a highlight, I would imagine. Mary's father would have worked on everything, from steamers and passenger ships to warships of Vickers and Maxim. But by the time his film of torpedo boats on the Manchester Ship Canal had been shot in 1901, Britain had its own pressing reasons to build warships and arms. Britain had been at war in South Africa with the Boer Republics for two years. The Boers were rebelling against Britain's attempts to appropriate their diamond mines, as well as extend the British Empire into their territory. The fighting force in South Africa was made up of professional soldiers, a number of semi-professional militias, as well as volunteers. But there were problems with recruitment. Unlike today, where most people are too fat to join the army, in the Boer War, 40% of the volunteers were rejected because they were too small and malnourished. The army had already dropped the height requirement from 5 foot 6 to 5 foot 3, and in 1902 was dropped to 5 foot in an attempt to raise more recruits. The fighting in South Africa was particularly difficult to film as the war was fought largely guerrilla style. Cameramen couldn't get anywhere near the action and there were no TV war correspondents. Mitchell and Kenya were never ones to miss out on a business opportunity. They cashed in on the new trend for South African war actualities. They simply reenacted famous wartime events and battles, as well as inventing their own patriotic stories. Using amateur actors, they filmed them in the Yellow Hills just outside Blackburn. The audiences didn't care much for accuracy. They knew they weren't real and simply enjoyed the drama. They wanted stories. It didn't matter how they got them. Showmen would even employ people to fire guns and throw smoke bombs in the audience to add to the atmosphere. 
Richard and Kenyon also made films of true Boer War heroes as they returned from South Africa. Two films have titles scratched on the front. This one says simply, Clive Wilson Hull. And this one, Private Ward of Leeds, 1901. To find out more about these men, we went to the British Library's newspaper collection to read the report of the time. We found accounts of the homecomings. One is in the Yorkshire Post for December the 10th, 1900. It says here, Private Ward VC welcomed home to Leeds, an enthusiastic reception. However, the reporter reveals that um, Ward was far from happy by all this attention. It says here that uh, the cheers he found far more disconcerting than anything he'd met in South Africa. <laughs> now, this account from the Hull Daily Mail, April 7th, 1902, says, back from the front, Mr. Clive Wilson's homecoming, a popular welcome. It also says here, Clive's strong personality had moved the people of Hull as that of few other men could have done. He's a blooming toff, was quite a common remark, and just as expressive as the more polished phrases which were used to convey the same meaning. Fascinatingly, the grandsons of both these men are living, and we have discovered them. So now this is the train arriving. The train arriving, yes. Gosh, what crowds! It's Top been... hats as well. Amazing. The son of a wealthy Hull shipping family, Lieutenant Clive Wilson was awarded a DSO, Distinguished Service Order. His grandson, Clive Wilson, carries a family name. They're trying to get oh, there's, this. Oh, there's, 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 there's Clive, Clive coming through the middle, being sort of jostled and rather amazed about the, the huge number of people. He's totally overwhelmed, obviously, very surprised. And he's got this tremendous hat on. Do you think that the shipyard, in fact, gave them a day off to welcome him home? I would, that's what one would, can only imagine. Poor chap, he's having to try and make a speech on the spur of the moment. I mean, he was, sure he's got he was overwhelmed, result. wasn't he? And he couldn't think what to say. Well, even though he was a very good actor and a great comedian, just like me, he was never very good at making speeches. He was always caught short of words. I don't know what they're doing with that ladder in the background there. They've obviously all been clambering up on the roofs to see him. Very emotional moment, coming home. Because he was terribly popular. He was just called Clive, and everyone else was Mr. Yes, Mr. Yes, that's Kenneth right, Mr. Kenneth. Yes. Of course, the, the, the amazing thing is, I mean, one's only ever seen static photographs of him before, and um, not many of those, because let's face it, he died in 1921. That's getting Muriel getting yes. into a carriage. Muriel was his sister, and his mother was Mary. And that's Mary's back view. It's just quite extraordinary to actually see them as sort of moving, sentient beings. I mean, Aunt Muriel, of course, survived till 89, so we knew her reasonably well. But, of course, he died ages before I was born, so, of course, we had no idea what he was like. In fact, rarely, I don't suppose my father had much memory of him either, because he was... Uh, he was he 12 died. when he died. Of course, his mother had been sending out all those provisions out, yes, that was out to the Boer War, hadn't she? He'd write letters back saying, um, food's not too good here, I could do with a few partridge. So he got his mother, believe it or not, to send out tins of potted partridge all the way from Hull uh, via, by ship to Cape Town and then on on the train all the way up to try and find him somewhere up in the Transvaal. I mean, it's the most amazing logistical exercise, even today. Oh, our, our highest, highest praise. praise. Isn't that great? Really, it seems all a bit undeserved, doesn't it? And he was just really, he was a messenger between, between one general and another, no more than that. And, you know, he got into this battle and had two fingers shot off. And that got him invalided out. So, and God alone knows how he ever got the DSO. There, now there's that's Arthur, Arthur and Mary. Arthur and Mary, his parents. And there's, there's there Clive and there's Muriel, Muriel with him. I must say, Muriel's got a pretty sort of risque cap on. She looks 
as if she's got a cloth cap, rather like all, all the lads from the docks. And then this boy, well, these wonderful hats that the women have too, and scarves. And oh, yes, one of the young thing. chaps got a hat just like Clive's. Mr. Bowlegs comes out again. Yes. Basically, he's got a horse between his legs even if he's walking. walking. Oh, you can see there, his two fingers have been shot off. Shot off, yes. He was what when he went? Probably 24, 25? Here was an opportunity for adventure. And, uh, he was patriotic. Uh, no doubt patriotic, but I mean, I think it was actually this sort of adventure yes. and excitement and uh, get out and see the world. Because you I mean, didn't go backpacking then. You obviously went off to war, didn't you? It was your opportunity. Yes. yes. And uh, I mean, it must have been quite exciting. Let's face it, you know, you're, you're a young man of 25 and, and there you are going out and galloping all over the felt. And um, uh, you never probably ever thought uh, well, you might get shot, um, but uh, you, you just went for the, the excitement of it. 10 o'clock, we profiled the Commander-in-Chief of Fighter Command during the Battle of Britain, here on History. Private Ward of Leeds joined the King's own Yorkshire Light Infantry. Volunteering to carry a request for reinforcements through ferocious enemy fire, Ward saved his besieged comrades' lives. He was awarded the Victoria Cross, the highest award for bravery. Private Ward's VC made him a local hero in Leeds, and this rather strange silent interview with the showman was made. For the audience, was hearing the showman's running commentary, as well as seeing the actual person on film that counted. His grandson, Mick Ward, still lives in Leeds. My granddad was the last person to be personally given the Victoria Cross by Queen Victoria because this was just the week before she died. And there was the big celebration of my granddad coming back to Leeds. And I think it was a recognition that he was a working class lad from that area who, who'd fought for Queen and country, but who also, I think, had represented that, that sense of comradeship and support for each other and an incredible act of bravery, and people wanted to recognise that. Some people watching would know who he was and know of the deed, but maybe not the detail. And so it would be just a case, I think, of them seeing him, or well, not in the flesh, but fairly close to being in the flesh. And, you know, there's the bit there, he's actually holding the VC in, ha in his hand, he's the presenter, and showing it out to people. He's obviously talking both about his experience and what he went through, but also the impact it had on himself, you know, and he's actually touching the different parts of his body, presumably, because, you know, he was shot a number of times, and that must still be having an effect, and it did affect him, you know, later on in life as well. It's obviously winter, and I presume that's snow that's lying around. It's a sort of a bit of a strange background with a sort of wooden planks everywhere. It, it some, looks like some derelict warehouse. I think what's odd about it is the fact that it actually exists, that sense that it was that important that uh, somebody could be bothered to film. And then just seeing your father's father, what have you inherited, I think that's quite interesting. Particularly in the profile bits where you do recognise yourself a bit, and I think that's a bit strange. Because uh, certainly I've, I've never seen moving film of my dad. Uh, so there's that sort of generation leap. Uh, and then just the odd mannerism seems familiar. I've got a son who's, who's 21 and this will be when he was 23 and he looks much more similar to my son. And then at the end, you know, they come at now the sort of big, big shake of hand and thank you and the stop, look back, in, you know, making him look into the camera and I think that's a really nice sort of ending for it as he sort of looked into presumably the people who were watching at the time. By now, Sagar Mitchell and James Kenyon were doing very well out of the cinematograph business in Blackburn. They were making hundreds of local topicals and working with a big network of showmen. Showmen and cameramen were coming to their shop from all over the north to buy film and equipment, to get their films printed and to commission them to make films. Mitchell even went on a couple of business trips. He travelled from Blackburn to trade fairs in Leipzig and Paris. Trade was good and it was getting better.
Although not a single cinema had been built, the appetite for local films was seemingly unending. Audiences were packing the fairgrounds and music halls to see their films. If these wonderful films hadn't been found, then so much about their world would have been lost to us. The world of ordinary men and women in towns, on trams, coming home from work, coming home from the war. Next, more adventures with Mitchell and Kenyon and the mad world of the showman. We'll explore sport and pleasure in Edwardian England. We'll watch our workers on holiday and we'll also be showing a world exclusive. The first ever film of Manchester United. Watching Paramount 2, the home of...